Welcome back. I'm David the Good and today I'm going to share with you five ways you can eliminate 90% of pests from your garden. Did you know that 78% of statistics are just made up on the spot? Yeah, so I'm saying 90%, but, but functionally speaking, getting rid of pests in your garden, you, you're not gonna really have pest problems anymore if you follow these principles. One of the main questions I get asked on a regular basis is how do I spray for this? Or what do you spray for this? Or how do you get rid of this? Or how do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? How do you deal with this? And it's and it's in reference to I've got these beetles chewing this thing or I've got nematodes eating this or I've got this eating this and this eating this and this eating this. Now the first thing I'm going to tell you is this is not going to help you get rid of deer or rabbits or gophers. Okay so getting into big animal territory these tips are not gonna work for that. What you do for that is you put in a good fence or you get a good farm dog to patrol the perimeter and make sure. So let's just take the gigantic herbivores out of the equation right now. We're talking about insect pests and most disease issues. So let's go to number one. Number one, feed the soil. Okay. We have this idea that we feed the plants, right? You throw a little bit of fertilizer out there and it feeds the plants. But really what you're doing is feeding the soil ecosystem and then the soil ecosystem is feeding your plants. So there are fungi that connect to the roots, there are bacteria that are operating around the roots that are living and dying rapidly, releasing nitrogen, releasing minerals. So you're gonna feed the soil. If the soil is good, you will notice that you have less pest problems. Let me give you a really quick example of that from our gardens this year. We had an area of unimproved grass where we just knocked some areas out, knocked the grass out by putting some pigs on the area and they tore it up. And then we made some little mounds and we threw a little bit of compost in the mounds and we planted pumpkins. So we did a minimum of soil improvement, a minimum of clearing weeds and we just let the pumpkins run over that area. Well, it was hot, it was dry, the soil is not particularly good and we got some pumpkins but it was not awesome we're talking like two or three pumpkins per vine meanwhile at the same time sometime last fall we threw some pumpkin guts into our compost pile and that compost pile was just this great big mound of kitchen scraps and garden waste and yard waste and all that stuff and it was all mounded up and piled and had rotted down and in the spring pumpkins started growing out of it. That one pumpkin vine gave us 165 pounds of amazing little excellent pumpkins. Over 40 pumpkins, 45 at last count and I noticed that as the weather is cooling off there's another round of pumpkins still growing out of those same plants. It looks like we're gonna get another 10 or 20 pumpkins out of that vine over there. That is ridiculous. And that's because there was a huge amount of organic matter, there's a huge amount of minerals to pull from, the plant never has stress. Even though we didn't water it, it just kept going and going and going. So compared to the plants that had a, a small amount of help to the ones that have a large amount of help, Pests and diseases attack plants that are already weak. If you are unhealthy, you are more susceptible when you get sick than somebody who is very healthy, very well fed. That's why malnutrition leads to a bunch of other diseases. And that's the same thing in your garden. The pests are not nearly as big a deal for plants that are already thriving, that already have good soil. So the first thing is, improve that soil, get lots of organic matter in there, get lots of minerals in there, whatever you need to do, if that means throwing around kelp meal, if that means composting all of your grass clippings and putting it in your garden, if that means making a lasagna garden. If you do not feed the soil well, the plants are unhappy and that is a first vector of failure. That's where your pests and diseases are going to be a bigger problem. Number two is mix everything up. If you mix everything up, you mix up the pests. Nature strives to correct imbalances. That's the way she was designed. So if you have a big field of corn, everything that eats corn comes in there and starts eating the corn. If you have any kind of a monoculture, generally what will happen is that looks like an imbalance. In a natural system, you have a whole bunch of different species together, and those different species together help balance everything out. So you don't 
spread a big smorgasbord for corn earworms. Corn, 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 corn. If you look at the way the Native Americans grew corn, they often had corn, they had squash, they had beans, sometimes they had tobacco, sometimes they had bee balm and other herbs, they had other things mixed in. And if you have a forest ecosystem, you see usually very little issues with pests because there's a whole bunch of different things going on. So the, the pest that wants to come and eat your tomato has to go through a little bit of corn, a little bit of cabbages, it has to go past the ginger, it's gotta go past your currant bushes, whatever. And, 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 and it's not like, there's so much food here. It's sort of like, where am I? Is there any food around here? It really drops your pest issues significantly to even plant two or three things together. But if you can plant four, five, 10, 100 things together, like in this big mess here, you know, you can see stuff is fading out from the summer. Things are giving up. Some of these flowers are done. We've got the sweet potatoes growing underneath. We've got cannas, we've got cassava, we've got the gingers that are starting to go to sleep. We've got turmeric back here. We had watermelons growing through here. We have taro, we have rosa rugosa, we have mulberries, we have zinnias, we have lantanas. We've got just a ridiculous group of stuff all growing together. And what happens is, is you don't have the major pest issue that just wipes everything out. And another thing that you have is you have all kinds of food redundancy. If one crop gets attacked, well, shoot, you've got 10 other things growing at the same time. Not that big a deal. So even if you have some losses, it's not that big a deal. It's a much more stable system than if you have a monoculture and it's much less attractive to pests. Number three, plant what likes your climate. If it is adapted to your climate, it is going to be much happier and it is going to have less issues, significantly less issues. Behind me here, I have yams. This is a tropical root crop. I'm in zone 8B. This is not the tropics, but we have a long, hot, humid season that goes back and forth between being droughty and being piles and piles of rain all at once. And the yams love it. But there are crops from further north that do not love it here. Jerusalem artichokes, so-so. When we were in Tennessee, Jerusalem artichokes were a weed. And I've talked about comfrey before. Comfrey is a common herb. It's a great nutrient accumulator. It's a wonderful permaculture plant. Here, it often burns to the ground and dies. People will say, don't plant mint where it can take over your gardens. People saw that I had mint in my herb gardens. So don't plant mint where it's gonna take over. It doesn't take over here. As a matter of fact, it's all dead. August killed our mint. 100 degrees, 100 degrees, 100 degrees, 100 degrees. The stuff over it that was shading it started to die out. The mint died, totally toast. So in one place where you have something that's just crazy invasive, super easy to grow, and then you, have the, you plant the same plant in a different climate, it totally doesn't love it. When we were down in the tropics, we couldn't grow white potatoes, but we could grow breadfruit. We could grow yams. Orange sweet potatoes did so-so. So it, it, it depends on where you are, what's really gonna grow. And if you grow something that doesn't fit your climate, it's like the pests know when they just come in to eat it. They totally wreck it. So you have to plant what loves your climate, what grows easily in your area. So you figure that out by talking to old gardeners that are on your street. What grows easily for you? What variety of tomato do you grow that grows so well here? What does excellently? What's the simplest thing to grow? You know, in some places people were like, I just got piles and piles and piles of fill in the blank. But I can't grow anything since I moved to Atlanta, right? So the problem is, is you're not growing what grows in that climate. These grow like weeds in our climate and therefore they're one of our main staple crops. We're not trying to grow russet potatoes here because they don't really grow well here. I mean, we did try and they're, they were sad. So what do we grow? Yams. Lots and lots of yams. We grow lots and lots of sweet potatoes. Super easy to grow, adapted to the climate, and the pests mostly leave them alone. They're vigorous and they're well adapted. So you could figure this out yourself by planting a whole ton of different crops and then don't treat them particularly well. The ones that live through and produce for you with a minimum of care, those are your winners. That's how I wrote the book, Totally Crazy Easy Florida Gardening. It's, a, it's been a bestseller on Amazon. What I did is in our Florida gardens, I planted a whole bunch of different plants from around the world, staple crops, looking for high calorie crops, looking for high nutrition crops, looking for stuff that produced through the summer. And I tried all kinds of different things and I didn't treat them particularly well. We, we grew them organically. We didn't 
water that much. We didn't feed them with huge piles of compost and try to baby them and make cedar-sided raised beds and stuff like that. We put everything out and the plants that just did awesome no matter what were the plants that I recommended. That's how you make your garden easy. You plant the stuff that actually wants to grow in your climate and it's super easy. And this is a concept that really escapes a lot of people. If you can remember that, to plant what really grows easily in your climate. If you can figure out that, that is your main key to having big harvests and less pest issues because a plant is already not stressed because it likes where it is. Number four, stop spraying, okay? If you spray poisons, you have to play God and you have to continuously spray poisons because there are checks and balances all over nature that you are knocking out. Let me give you a quick example of this. Some years ago, we had a big problem with caterpillars in our garden. We always had caterpillars showing up in the spring, tearing everything up. Then I watched a video by Paul Wheaton where he's interviewing this girl and this girl's talking about their hedge of gooseberries somewhere up north. The hedge of gooseberries was consistently eaten by caterpillars until one year, so when some paper wasps built a big old nest, like actually hornets, like those northern hornets, we don't have those down here. Great big hornet's nest. And suddenly, the caterpillar problems went away. Why? Because hornets eat lots of caterpillars. And I realized wasps eat caterpillars. I'm always looking around my garden and looking at the wasps in my garden and going, what? What? I, I don't want wasps in my garden. What are they doing? They're just looking at me with their mean little beady eyes. Everywhere I go, there's wasps going, hey. You know, like turning their little heads. Hey. I'm like, I don't want that. Get out of my garden. So around the edges of my house, knock the wasp nest down, spray them with poison, get rid of them. 10 years ago, I was knocking the wasps out. I'm not gonna get stung. I don't want any wasps in my garden. They're nasty. There's no possible use for wasps. Then I watched this little video. And I thought, what do wasps eat? I guess I always thought they ate nectar or something. No, it turns out they love caterpillars. They eat tons of caterpillars. Then I stopped knocking down the wasp nests around the edges of my property. And another thing I did was I noticed the wasps were always building inside of the mailbox. They would always build inside of the mailbox for some reason our poor mailman was always like spraying wasps in the mailbox. Oh, wasps like mailboxes, perfect. So I got some old mailboxes and I nailed them up on posts around the edge of my garden. I had a friend who had tons and tons and tons of different junk because he just collected tons of junk. And I said, do you have any old mailboxes? And he said, yeah, actually I got like five of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I took his old mailboxes and he gave them to me and I just put them up over the gardens. Each one of them filled up with wasps. Guess what? Next year, caterpillars were gone. Gone, like caterpillars stop being a problem. We stopped spraying the wasps, the caterpillars went away. This happens when you have aphids. You have aphids show up in huge amounts. You're like, oh no, the aphids are gonna destroy everything. You spray. Usually there are already ladybug eggs or ladybug larvae in the area at the time that you spray. You spray them, you knock all that out. Now you've just cleared the thing. Well, guess what? The pests breed a lot faster than the predators. So if you knock out the pests, you knock out the predators before the predators can do what the predators do. So if you could tolerate some damage for a period of time and you already have things mixed up, you already have good soil, often what happens is the predators move in and they clear it out. Stop spraying, stop spraying. You actually need a certain amount of pests in your garden because that keeps the predators fed. A little bit of pest damage, the occasional hole in a leaf, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you lose some of your crops to that because you're not having to play God. You're not having to go and spray. And of course, you don't want to poison yourself anyways. So stop spraying. If you have to spray all the time, that is an ecosystem problem. And you're perpetuating it. You're just clearing out the ecosystem of everything that could possibly put checks and balances on the pests. And the pests come back faster than the predators. So stop spraying and leave lots of habitat. Habitat. Wait, that's number five. So you stop spraying and you put up some mailboxes or something for the wasps. That's cool. That's the beginning of it. One of the things that I've really noticed as well is if you clean your garden up so it looks really perfect, I know that you want to do this. You clean your garden up so it looks really perfect. It doesn't look like this big jungle mess that we created. You know, this garden has only been here for just about one year and it already looks like an insane jungle. And this is on purpose. 
I have so many different species in here, which all provide habitat for different things. But beyond that, we have a mixture of annuals and perennials together. And this is important because your perennial plants provide cover for predator insects and beneficials during the season when everything is freezing down and disappearing. And the various debris, you know, the, the mulch on the ground and dead sunflower stems and things like that. These are places for ladybugs to overwinter and beneficial wasps and spiders and all kinds of other things. They will live in this. So if you clean everything up and you strip it all bare and you just have this empty ecosystem, you have an empty ecosystem. And remember, the pests breed faster than the predators. You want places for all those predators to live. You want banks of life. Even just having hedgerows. The English used to have hedgerows all over the place. There still are hedgerows there. But many people in modern times have tried to utilize every single bit of space to grow big monocultures of crops. And so they eliminate the hedgerow. Well, the hedgerow is where the birds live. The hedgerow is where your pollinators live. That's where your wasps and your bees and your spiders and your frogs and your lizards and all these good guys live over there and they help balance the pests. Even if you're growing a monoculture next to it, the benefit of having that vibrant living ecosystem with all of those perennials, all of those fallen leaves, all of those hollow sticks, those dead trees, all of that is space for life to live, to come and balance out your garden. That is a repository of life. And that's not even counting all the fungi and bacteria around the roots that are living and colonizing and building and doing things beneath the soil that we don't even begin to understand. So when I have a mulberry growing over sweet potatoes with some zinnias because I like them, next to some sugarcane, next to some Everglades tomatoes, next to a peach tree, next to some tobacco. It's just complicated. There's a lot of space in here for life. And there are weeds that I want to knock out of here and, and get rid of because I don't like them. But even the weeds are harboring some life. Even if you left bands of weeds around the edges of your garden, it's going to be a seeding issue, but it's also going to be a place for lots of life to live. So if you've got some Queen Anne's lace and you're not saving carrot seed, nah, just leave the Queen Anne's lace. I leave the dandelions. I love the dandelions. They can seed themselves in my garden. I don't care. Got some wild onions in here. I don't care. All these things are different places for different plants to live. So you get people talking about companion planting and how this loves this and this loves this and this loves this. I don't get serious about that. I think it works because if you just throw a whole ton of stuff together, you get many different checks and balances. You get both habitat plus you have confusing smells and you have less than a smorgasbord. You have this plant that loves you know, that has this bug that it's attracted to it, but that bug also has predators that live over here on this plant. It's great. So the more you mix it up, the better. Let the companions figure themselves out. Just plant everything together and you will get a ton of food. There is a ton of food still in the ground here, even though we haven't regularly irrigated, we haven't regularly weeded, we haven't come through here and thrown 10, 10, 10, and we haven't sprayed anything full of life, full of checks and balances, and if something is weak, we let it die. Because there are plenty of other things that can take its place. So don't get too precious over each individual plant. Just let it die. Let it die. It doesn't matter. Plant something else. That plant maybe wasn't supposed to be where it is. So I hope that those tips are just kind of a quick overview of five ways you can eliminate pests from your garden. And I'm saying 90%. But we do have pests in the garden. I mean, look. There are holes in the sweet potato leaves. But we still harvest tons and tons of sweet potatoes. We get baskets and baskets of sweet potatoes. I like to see a few little holes in the sweet potato leaves. There's still some little pest insects around here. But there are predators that are controlling them because we still get piles and piles and piles of sweet potatoes. If this was all a sweet potato area and one particular pest came in, it could have shredded all these leaves and destroyed all these leaves and they would just look like netting. That's a serious problem and that's a sign of an imbalance. A few holes in the leaves means there's no poison on it. It's safe for you to eat as well. This is okay. I don't mind sharing with a few pests because all the checks and balances are gonna work themselves out. So don't get hung up on that one plant that's gotten sick. 
plant a whole bunch of different things, let them all live together, plant what loves your climate, and you will have way less pest issues. Thanks for joining me. I'm David the Good. Please like and subscribe to this channel if you find it useful. And check out my books. I will put a link below. I write gardening books for a living, and I do YouTube mostly for fun. So I'm glad you've joined me. Catch you all next time. Be sure to check out the links below. And until we meet again, may your thumbs always be green. Discover the beauty and efficiency behind Grocery Row Gardening. Create a backyard where fruits, herbs, vegetables, and flowers all grow together within proper spacing. In Grocery Row Gardening, you'll find the tools and systems you need to keep your family fed. Buried my rabbit beneath the cherry tree One fine afternoon Someday I know that we'll meet again On a fruit salad spoon Laid my hamster to rest last night Beneath the pumpkin vine Day I know that we'll meet again in a Thanksgiving.